Blake's. Like, hey, Scoob, did you hear Nikki Blake is hosting a Scooby-Doo panel? No. Yeah. Like on today's Scooby-Doo episode, Scooby-Doo and Shaggy meet Nikki Blake. Yeah, in a Scooby panel. <laughs> like, we need to get this puppy started. Yeah, okay. Nikki Blake, take it away, Scooby-Doo. <laughs> On today's episode of the Scooby Panel, Nikki and Wendy meet voice actor Dino Andrade. And the actual Mexican pronunciation is Andrade. So let's talk about your career. How did you get into voice acting? I got into voice acting uh, back in 1984, 85, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, I was actually working uh, as a Foley walker if you know what that is, a person who does sound effects live to picture. Uh, you know, like if there's a, uh, like say they're filming a, a scene with two people walking down a sidewalk, they're not gonna mic their feet. They're just gonna mic the actors to get the dialogue nice and clear. The footsteps are added in later. That's done by a Foley walker, as opposed to a sound effects guy who would, it would cost a mint to sit with sound effects and put in each step as they they walked along so no they actually have a person who puts on shoes similar to what is watched on screen and it's on a stage that has multiple surfaces for all kinds of different environments and mics are down low and my job would be to watch the screen and uh, as the person's walking i'm walking with them and that puts all this and other things like you know punching someone being me and another foley walker i might i would have a catcher's mitt the other guy would have an arrow and as the guy throws the punch he'd do the in front of the mic with the arrow and i punched the catcher's mitt you know uh and and there's your your punch and i was working on a film uh in 1984 uh, that was released in 85 called House, directed by William Cat. I mean, not directed by starring William Cat and Richard Mull. It was directed by um, Steve Miner, Steve Miner. And uh, I was working on a lot of the Foley effects on that film. Uh, and there was this uh, creature in it um, that they called the Little Critter. And uh, this was uh, actor Felix uh, uh, Silla, who was uh, uh, a little person. Uh, who was Cousin It in the original um, Adams Family. He was also in, I, I believe it was uh, uh, um, uh, Return of the Jedi as a number of the Ewoks and so on. And, and he was in the monster suit and had this big grin. It was supposed to be laughing and smiling, but they didn't have an actual laugh or, or for it. And me, I just stepped in front of the mic and just did this. <laughs> and Steve Miner said, that, that, use that. And that's where my voiceover career began. Uh, it was also my, my, my first uh, experience with Hollywood disappointment because uh, my girlfriend at the time and my family, we all went to the premiere in Westwood and we watched the movie and we heard me on the screen and a few other background characters throughout the movie. Uh, and then the credits rolled and my name isn't in the credits. Oh, yeah. and uh, and I've never been able to get that corrected. I've I've written to the IMDb several times saying I'm the voice of the little critters, and they keep writing back saying the the credits have already been marked closed by the producers or something like that. You know, you know. Wow. I was like, oh well, but that's <laughs> that's where it started. So I worked in voiceover, uh, doing a whole bunch of stuff, uh, and some on camera. Uh, from 85 through about 91, 92. And at that point, I transitioned over to independent filmmaking, thought I'd take that, take my shot at that. And I did that for about 10 years. Uh, and then in the early 2000s, I decided to return to voiceover. It was, it was just one of those things where where I, I, I hadn't originally planned on it. Um, uh, I, I was I wanted to get back into the industry and I had heard about a show. I think it was called Vampire Princess. I think it was a, an anime show that was looking for writers. And I got hold of the name of one of the producers and I called up uh, to, to inquire about a writing gig on this because I had had you know some writing experience with the, the filmmaking and, and been being film school and so on and 
and when they answered, they asked, are you the actor auditioning for St. Tail? And I said, yes. And they said, well, can we do the audition over the phone? I said, sure. And so they faxed me sides and I did an audition and I got a part on the show, St. Tail. And I thought, okay, I guess this is where I'm supposed to be. And I got back into training. I had done a lot of training beforehand I, with, the, with the, uh, uh, Judith Weston through the Meisner Institute and the Groundlings and, and all of this. I've been through lots and lots of back and training and film and so on. But I went, I went back to it and I've been in voiceover ever since. That's great. That's, it's really interesting to hear about um, the work that you started in and doing the sound effects for walking or things like that, just because I have always, I guess, thought that they just used sound effects, that maybe they had a library of sound effects. So it's interesting to know how that's actually done. Yeah, yep, that's called Foley walking. Yeah, well, if you see the movie, you'll see a sequence where uh, uh, Roger Cobb, played by William Cat, has like these shears and he's stabbing this monster. And that's actually me stabbing a watermelon with a screwdriver. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Because it really, it's a lot easier and it's a lot faster to do it all live right there than to pay a guy to painstakingly find effects and put them in and so on. Whereas Foley walkers, they're just trained to, oh, I know it'll make that sound, this, you know, <laughs> and just do it right there. And right. yeah, you know, and it's still done to this day. <laughs> That's great. It's really cool. You wrote a couple of TV movies. Was writing something that you wanted to pursue? Not they. They weren't TV movies. They were theatrical films. Uh, I I wrote. Uh, this is the funny thing. I wrote and sold sold four screenplays. Not one was produced. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I I don't remember who the writer was. It was some great writer who said the best thing that can ever happen to a writer so their work doesn't get screwed up is to sell it, but it never get made. <laughs> I wish it had gotten made, you know, yeah. but, but yeah, I had, I had written, I'd written a couple of horror films, a comedy, um, one action film and, and none of them got produced, you know, wow. I was like, but I got paid for them. Well, that's good. Uh, so, <laughs> You know, uh, uh, but it's, it doesn't really help the resume, you know, because it's, it's like, right. well, how much money did your movies make? And then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they made me plenty, you know. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it, it I, I am, I'm somewhat, a, a, for anybody who follows me on Facebook, Instagram, and so on, they know that I show my son lots of classic films and so on. I am, I'm, I'm a huge movie fanatic, particularly with regards to uh, genre films, sci-fi, horror, fantasy. I just, I love the fantasy worlds. And I, 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 I'm a big film history buff when it comes to, uh, to, to the history of genre films and, and the filmmaking history in period. And so I wanted to try my hand at filmmaking. And, and I, I really enjoyed it. I, I very, very much enjoyed it. Uh, uh, I, I directed one, one film that, that did the film festival circuit and I had a marvelous time doing it. The problem is that filmmaking, especially independent filmmaking is 90% is looking for money and trying to get distribution and all these things. And it, it is, it's soul crushing, it's heartbreaking. Um, and the whole time I was doing it, I was with Mary Kay and Mary Kay was very, very supportive, but she was always hoping I would return to acting because she always said you, you were happiest when you were an actor, particularly when I was, because uh, we were together at the, at the time I had gotten into the groundlings and, and, uh, and, and she just was like, you, you, you are so happy when you're, you know, doing funny stuff in front of people. You know, but I, but again, my love of movies, it was like, but I want to direct, you know, uh, but as it turned out, you know, she was right. And, and I'm, I've, I've not regretted my turn return to, uh, to acting one bit. That's great. Your son, Connor is also a voice actor. How he did is. he get into the business? Well, um, 
this is in my home. This is my booth. I built this. Um, and so he spent his whole life seeing me working in this. And he's just, I, he just naturally assumed this is what he would do. You know, I would come out and do something and he, he might, he started saying things like, you know, dad, if it was me, I'd use this voice. And he'd start, start doing, <laughs> you know? and, and it was, it was pretty funny. Uh, and, uh, and and I noticed a, a certain level of of sensitivity that I I tend to see in all actors that I've I've kind of noted in working with you know because we're we're uh, actors we're in order to really do our jobs we have to be a bit empathic you know because we we are replicating human behavior and and so there's there's that level of sensitivity and I and and from my transition from actor to director. And, and back to actor, I could I could see it from both sides. So I began to recognize this behavior in Connor. And so I, I, I put a script in front of him and I said, you know, let's 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 play with this. Let's read this. And we started doing uh, we started doing little, little little funny bits in videos. We just would make up and I'd post them on on Facebook and so on. So I had worked uh, on a film with a, a wonderful gal by the name of Lauren um who was directing me in a a uh, a french film that was being recorded in english don't know why but it was called uh spices uh it was all of these these species of animals but they were spies oh, and God. i was playing this and i was playing i was playing this really funny rat character in it right and while we were working on this film uh lauren uh, told me that the next movie that they were going to do was going to be another French film being recorded first in English. Uh, and this was a movie called Sam Sam. And it's going to involve, and she wanted me to read for the villain in this thing. And, uh, and it's going to involve a bunch of kids superheroes. And she saw a bunch of the videos that I was doing with Connor. And she asked, would Connor like to audition for this film? And I thought, well, at the time it was only eight. And I had already spoken to a couple of people about possibly getting Connor into voiceover. And the general consensus that I was given was that you really should wait till he's at least nine because he'll start having much better retention. And so I thought, well, it's a little early, but I'll ask him. And I asked, hey, Connor, would you like to, to try this? He's like, sure. You know. <laughs> And so Lauren turned out to live not far from me, mere blocks. So we got together and we worked with Connor. And then I went to my agent, uh, um, the folks over at, at Atlas. And I would said, hey, uh, would you represent my son? He's going to audition for this thing. And they said, well, we will. But understand that this is just a favor. Um, you know, he will be uh, like an independent contractor, not really a client of Atlas. And I was like, that's fine. So he auditioned, then he got a call back and I recorded the call back on video. And it was this long call back. They put him through his paces and I sent the video to the agents because it was just so darn cute. And the agents saw that and they said, would he audition for this? And it was an episode of Super Wings and he booked it. Then they said, well, would he audition for this? And it was a, com a, a commercial for Google for something. And he booked that. And he wound up, and of course, he got the Sam Sam movie, and I did play the villain in that. You'd find it on Amazon or something. Um, I'm the Martian guy in that one. I'm the villain. And, um, and he did something I have never seen before happen. <laughs> he, he booked six straight gigs, six straight weeks in a row. Wow. All right. And all of a sudden, the agency was like, here's the contract. Welcome to the Atlas family. <laughs> and, and, and that was it. And he's been working ever since, you know. Uh, and when the, when the pandemic hit, it was, it was, it was kind of a open gates for us because we, we wound up out of work for a few weeks. And then people realized, well, you know, voiceover actors can work from home. So they put out a call and said, who at home actually has a recording studio? So I was like, I, I do. I've had one for, you know, years. 
And all of a sudden, Connor and I started getting every audition down the pike, and and we started and we worked the entire pandemic, um, right there. Yeah, and and so he's 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 a busy little guy. That's that's awesome. That, good for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really incredible. Yeah, especially because we have talked to a lot of people, and they're very passionate about what they do. But their kids are really not interested in anything that they've done, even not even forget about following in their footsteps. They're just really not interested at all. And so to see a situation where obviously you must be a really great dad for your <laughs> son to have watched you doing your job and seeing that you loved it and it looked really, really, really fun that he wanted to do it and that he's this good at it this young props to you and that's I think Thank that's you. one of the best stories that I think I've heard and I yeah like he 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 absolutely loves it right now he is in uh his school's musical production of Greece uh it actually premieres this weekend uh and and you know he had told me ages ago I mean I told him I wanted him to stay in voiceover because uh I could keep an eye on him there was no, I didn't have to worry about him doing any on-camera work where he'd, he'd be off on a movie set and, and I couldn't watch him. You know, he's, he is, he is my everything. Um, uh, and, but I said, you know, if there's a stage thing, that, so, and he was like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to do anything where I would have to memorize lines. I'm perfectly happy reading, you know, my lines on script, so on. Um and then completely out of the blue, he just comes in and says, Dad, I changed my mind. They have this show, Grease. I want to audition for it. Right. Okay. You know, <laughs> I had never, I had never done a musical. Like, alrighty. You know, I was, I was, I was just not, I'm not, not, I was, I've just never been a musical kind of guy. I mean, in school, they would do musicals and non-musicals. And I would always do all the stagecraft work for the musicals and be in the non-musicals. Because you know? <laughs> you know? uh, it's just, that's just never been my thing. But he's like, I want to do it. I was like, you go, son. You know, that's great. Because um, I kind of felt like I found my own people when I found theater craft in high school. And here he is, he's found his own people in middle school. So yeah. <laughs> I'm happy for him. Absolutely. Just curious, what is he doing in the, in Greece? Uh, he's playing Melvin. Okay. He's playing Melvin. Nice. All right. Excellent. So you guys have worked together on some projects. We have. What is it like working together? And when you're recording, do you actually get to interact with each other in the booth? We, we only got to interact with each other on Sam Sam. But everything else we've done, like episodes of, uh, of We Baby Bears, um... Uh, there's a couple other things that we've done together um, we've recorded separately because that's typically how it's done mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very very seldom that we all record together it, in fact there's a, a show that's internationally all over the place for some reason it's not in the United States I don't know why it's a wonderful wonderful show a show called the Beach Buds and I'm the star of that and we recorded that for over six months and it was recorded ensemble, me and the entire cast. And it was the, the greatest job I've ever had. It was absolutely recorded together every Tuesday for half a year. And it was sheer joy every single week. And we're still, all of us are still in touch and great friends. And we've, we've watched the show thanks to, you know, the magic of VPNs, because uh, it's in so many countries around the globe and it is is marvelous delightful show i wish it was here hopefully it will be someday um but that was just the best because we were there and and we knew that this was not the way things are usually done anymore uh so 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 yeah that we we did not have that opera we've not had that opportunity to be side by side in mike said that this is not how it works um but since he's recorded all of we baby bears in that booth I'm right here, <laughs> you know? uh, um, monitoring the levels and everything. So I've seen everything he's done. And then when I've worked on We Baby Bears, 
he's right here, you know, and can see what I'm doing and, and so on. And that's, that's really fun. That's been, that has been great. And then to see the final episodes and, and hear us together, it's marvelous. It the same thing when we first saw Sam Sam, I was like, oh, this is magical, you know, very bucket list kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's really great. So you have voiced a very wide range of characters, good guys, bad guys, funny sounding, serious scaring, uh, uh, pardon me, serious sounding and a little bit of scary in there too. Yeah. But what is your favorite kind my, of voice to do? My favorite, my absolute favorite is anything having to do with comedy. I, I love making people laugh absolutely love making people laugh um so my I, I, my favorite thing is um hang on just a second there i'm gonna pull up there's a quote there's a lot to be said for making people laugh did you know that's all some people have it isn't much but it's better than nothing in this cockeyed caravan that is a quote from the preston sturges film sullivan's travels i wanted to get that right and that is that's like that's that's a motto to live by. It's it's my favorite quote in any film. Uh, Sullivan's Travels is a masterpiece if you haven't seen it. Um, that's my favorite thing to do. Uh, my favorite would have to be the character that I did in the Beach Buds. Uh, this, this character of Bile with this funny little bird, and uh, he he holds this resort together. Um, I, I also love to do anything that is connected to sci-fi horror and fantasy i mean uh, uh working as the scarecrow for arkham asylum was 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 sheer joy to 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 play that kind of uh that kind of character and to originate that voice which was was really that that version of the character that that was magnificent i had such a wonderful wonderful time doing that and we worked on that for quite a long time uh that was that was really really fun um as opposed to those things that were just just straight drama um like i had pretty much a straight dramatic role in dishonored too but that's not to say i didn't enjoy that in fact that was that was an amazing challenge to do uh, there was this old guy who had had some brain damage and was in a bit of a and so it took that that role took a lot out of me and it was it was it was quite the challenge and and um boy it, it it was it was quite quite fulfilling to to do something like that um uh but all in all all in all i would say my my favorite thing is to make people laugh and and, and if I, to really boil it down character work not just voices, not just characters that are, are basically some different shade of me using my own voice, my own way of speaking, but where I'm actually putting on uh, that, that, that character voice thing of, of playing trick or treat, of putting on the mask and becoming something else. That's my favorite thing. I love character voices, character work. That's my forte. Um, it was funny, my, my very first agent way way back way back when they heard this voice and they were immediately oh we know what you're good for and they signed me and they started sending me every you know young kid sidekick and this guy and so on and i kept telling them i'm a character actor i'm from the groundlings let me let me get into some voices if you don't mind you know and and uh, and to no one's surprise i didn't book anything for over a year and they finally let me go when i got signed uh uh by another agency um, they understood that I was a character actor and started sending me character roles. And that's when I started booking. Uh, what you're hearing right now, I seldom ever book, ever. But but character parts, voices, all these, you know, you name it, I, I'm doing. There's a show on, on Disney. It, it's, it's coming to or is on, on Disney uh, called Morphal. Um, I play uh, Officer Freeze all that. And uh, once again, it's just another character voice. I love these things, you know, and that's that's me. I'm all about the characters. It's when when I was a kid um, and, and I, I, I started to to realize when I was when I hit that age where I began to realize that the people on screen that I'm watching were actors and they're acting. 
the one, and I've started to say, that looks like a fun job. It was all the character actors doing character. It was, it was, it was Charles Lawton in Hunchback of Notre Dame. It was, it was Boris Karloff in, in, in Bride of Frankenstein. You know, it was Albert Finney in Murder on the Orient Express. It was, it was uh, Roddy McDowell in Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. It was Eli Wallach in Tough Guys. Uh, it, it was William Bendix in, in uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. It was all these, these character roles that made me say, I want to do that. You know, Michael, Michael York in, uh, in the Island of Dr. Moreau. Not that he wasn't playing himself mostly, but the sequences where he was being transformed into an animal. That was just like, they just blew my mind. And, and I said, this is what I want to do. This is this, that, that. That's what I want to do. You know, I want to be the character guy. I want to be that dude who is practically unrecognizable. It's, it, it, it's, you know, these actors like Johnny Depp, who, you know, you can count on one hand how many performances he's done where he's just himself. He's always some, and it's like, yeah, that's the career. That's, that's it. You know, that's what I love is character work. Yeah you have such a passion for this that it's like it's it's infectious and it's just so nice to see and i'm not surprised that you're successful at this not not just because obviously you have a great voice for doing all these things but i really think that people don't understand how much passion plays into whatever job you're doing and if you are this passionate it really about does. it you know, and you, it helps sell whatever you're doing to the audience. We can feel when the voice actor is feeling the role and wants to be there and wants to be doing it and is like enjoying themselves. And it just makes it so much better for everyone. So that's Thank you. great. Thank really you. Great. Now you also do a lot of voice acting for video games. I do. So what, what is the difference? Is there any kind of a difference in the process between voice acting in a video game versus animation? Is one more difficult? And do you have a preference? Um, my preference is, is the, the non-video game world, but there's a reason for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy with both. But, but the big difference, which is where that preference is going to come from in a second here, the big difference uh, is not about the acting technique. Your, your craft as an actor ha has, has got to be the same, whether you're approaching something that is uh, uh, pre-recorded animation, original animation, or anime, or video game, or say your, your acting craft has to be the same. You've got, you still have to, you know, have that, that, that experience, that skill, that knowledge. Uh, that craft. You still have to have all those things. But the huge, huge difference is, is that when you are doing an original piece of animation, you get a script in advance and you get a chance to figure out what you're doing and why you're doing it and, and understanding all of those things that is wrapped up in this character. Whereas with video games, the producers are so paranoid that they're going to lose you know all their money if any secrets of the game get out they don't send you scripts you don't know what you're doing to you you audition for a character you get it but you're not gonna know what you're doing till you get to the job and it's to the point where um where they will have a big screen in the booth and your lines will be on that screen being fed to the screen by the director. And that's where you're seeing them for the first time. So even if they're discussing takes and what they're going to do, I can't look ahead to see what my next lines are because I don't have a script. It's, and it is what my friend Dave Fenoy, my good friend Dave Fenoy calls instant acting. You know, um, I, I remember when when I first, you know, came to Hollywood back in the 80s uh, and pounding the pavement, you would get these uh, magazines like Backstage West and Drama Log and you would circle the audition and so on. And there would always, there was, you would always see these ads for cold reading classes. And a lot of us didn't take that seriously because it was it was like this is just to fleece that new actor who just got off the bus because as trained actor 
they got their script, they broke it down, you figured out the spine of the scene, the spine of your character with the, you know, all the objectives, you figured, you broke this thing down, you were prepared before you read, right? So this cold reading thing, now cold reading is absolutely essential because you work on a video game, you can't be stumbling because they literally put you in and say, okay, voice monkey, act. You know, and sometimes you don't even really know what you're doing. I worked on, I worked on, uh, when I did um, Prey, um, no, this was Dishonored, Dishonored 2. When I did Dishonored 2, this was before the last contract, so they didn't even tell me what it was. I asked, can you now tell me what this project is again? I'm sorry, we can't. Thankfully, they're not allowed to do that anymore. But I didn't know what this was. And every scene that I was in, the director would tell me a generalization of what was going on, but not really tell me what was really happening in the scene. Just a generalization. And then they would tell me, okay, give me three in a row of each line. And I'm, I'm going. Now, I could see older older more you know actors from another era just saying i can't work like that i gotta have the script i gotta i gotta but me i just said you know what that's just a whole other that's another challenge i i think it's like it's like skydiving at night <laughs> jump out that plane <laughs> i'll pull out a ripcord when i think it's right you know even though i can't see a darn thing you know and and so i approached it that way and and so it's like fine hit me throw me those lines let that let let my let my acting training jump on every one of those lines, you know. And you tell me if I'm in the right direction because I ain't got a script. I got no idea, you know. So sometimes when I hear a criticism of a video game, where it's like the acting wasn't very solid in that. It's like I think ninety percent of the time I think don't blame the actors. Yeah. And sometimes don't even blame the director if it's a situation where the director has been told you can't tell them anything, you know. But a lot of that has now eased up a lot. You know, thanks to the new contracts where they're not allowed to keep, you know, things completely secret from actors. Um, but uh, it, it's still a situation of you don't get a script in advance. It, it just, it doesn't happen. And so that's the big difference between the two. And so I, I greatly prefer the, uh, 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 you know, the non-video game world so that I can see and process and, and, and work and let my imagination go and so on. Uh, and and have you know have ideas when I'm walking in and really collaborate with the director in that way and and really be, be feel like I'm 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 really a partner in process here you know yeah. uh, so that that's that's my my preference there yeah. that answer your question definitely and I had no idea had no idea that they would ever ask someone to just come in and blindly and be like cool this is what you're doing but you don't know until we're going to sit down and do it like that actually gave me a little bit of anxiety thinking about yeah. you have to do that that is the world of video games wow. that is the, the only video game in which you get the, the the scripts in advance um regularly that i work on is world of warcraft and star trek online uh, Star Trek in online, I get them uh, a few days in advance, mainly so that I can research uh, the pronunciations of any words. But being as I'm a Star Trek fanatic, that's never a problem. Uh, and World of Warcraft, uh, you get the scripts in advance. And by advance, I mean when you show up for the session, they give you the pages. So you have a chance to read them before you get in the booth. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay, props to everyone that does this because that's I can't I can't even imagine. I can't yeah. even imagine. Yeah, that's yeah, that. yeah. You to to work in video games in the modern world, you have to be a master cold reader. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to instantly create a performance. You have to. It's why I tell actors that probably the best training I ever had was with the groundlings in comedy improvisation. And I tell people all the time, you want to be a voice actor uh aside from acting classes you need to get into improv mm -hmm. you absolutely must it is it, it, there's there's no ifs ands or buts about it you know if you're one of these guys who's is, is like you know what i've got to read something three four five times to get over the stumbles and finally you'll never make it in video games they they expect instant mm -hmm. yeah yeah wow incredible so have you had any 
oh, wow, I can't believe I'm getting to do this moments in your career yet that you would like to share with us? When I got the part of Speedy Gonzalez for the uh, new Looney Tunes, that was that was huge for me, huge. Uh, because as a, as a Mexican-American uh, who grew up in the late 60s, early 70s, I am that old. Uh, I was born September 16th, 1963. For all of you sci-fi, horror, and fantasy fans, that is the day The Outer Limits premiered on television. Wow. Anyway, yes, uh, my wife found on eBay for me uh, a copy of the TV Guide that had the premiere of, of The Outer Limits on it. And there's, there's my birth date there. Anyway, um, growing up then, it, it was it's very, very difficult to find any kind of role models. And any, any Mexican characters were either the comic sidekicks, you know, like El Caban, you know, these guys, or, uh, or, or he was the, uh, you probably don't know anything about this, uh, uh, with a character known as the Frito Bandido which was this animated character in all the Frito-Lay Fritos commercials and he would steal all the corn chips and he was the Frito Bandito, right? <laughs> and and that, that character eventually went away when actor Ricardo Mantelban contacted the Frito-Lay company and said, does he have to be a Bandito? Couldn't he be a guy who gives the Fritos, shows up and gives them and so on? And the Frito-Lay company decided no, so we'll just drop the character completely. So uh, uh, that's how that went. So, so there wasn't any any positive character. And then along comes Speedy Gonzalez, and he was the hero, and that was quite magnificent. And uh, there was a character actor um, by the name of Jose Gonzalez Gonzalez, uh, who appeared in a number of of westerns throughout the forties, fifties. Uh, he did a lot of John Wayne films. And uh, Jose Gonzalez Gonzalez had a very specific accent. He sounded like this, right? This is what he said, right? Um, when Mel Blanc did the character of Speedy Gonzalez, he was doing an impression, a very close impression of the voice of Jose Gonzalez Gonzalez. And the design of Speedy Gonzalez looks like him. If you go online and you look up Jose Gonzalez Gonzalez Western and look at some of his pictures, put them side by side with Speedy Gonzalez, you realize, yes, this is him. So, we instantly recognized him and and it was like oh my god i can identify this with this this character and this guy was a hero this guy was a huge huge hero and so when i got the opportunity to audition for the role and to the best of my knowledge no actor of mexican descent had ever played the part at that point um i felt like there was a a huge responsibility uh, and since my, my film collection is massive, I got all my, my Looney Tunes and put them in closed captions so that I could get every little bit down that he, he said. And when I got the, the call that I had won the role, I, there was some major celebrating in a few tears here in the house because this was, this was huge. And unfortunately, they wound up only doing two episodes. Yeah, uh, because the Warner Brothers brass decided to change their mind on the character. Um, and so that there that went. And it was too bad because this was a big deal. They, they had re-envisioned the character as kind of a Zorro character, as a, as a masquerading hero. And they were even talking the possibility of a spinoff show based on him that they were privately talking to me about and so on. And then the whole thing just, just darn it went away. You know, but that was that was that was a big deal for me. Uh, another thing that was huge was getting the Scarecrow, because uh, Mary Kay had worked on Batman the Animated Series, and it felt very much like the uh, 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 worlds coming together. Uh, with Kevin Conroy as as my Batman, and Kevin Conroy was her Batman, and all, and so it was just that was also very very special, very very special. There's something else. Um, that unfortunately I'm not allowed to tell you about yet. <laughs> that is huge for me. Um, that I did for DreamWorks. Um, that I'm waiting for the movie to come out to find out if what I did in it remains in the film. I don't know because these things can change. 
But if it is, this will be huge for me, not in terms of career move, but in terms of it's a character that I have loved since I was this high. And when I got I when I got the audition, I thought there's no way I'm going to get this. And then when I got it, it was just I, I couldn't believe it. And then the sessions were canceled for technical reasons. And then finally, DreamWorks Amblin got it all together. And, and I, I finally got to record. And it was it was just sheer, sheer joy. And now I'm just, I'm waiting for the movie to come out to go see it and see if what I did is in there. And if it is, I'm I'm going to tell the world because this is something that is is, is kind of bucket list dream for me to do. So uh fingers crossed that 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 uh that i'm still in it we'll see you, you never know those things change the things you know an executive could step in and go change that voice mm -hmm. you know so i i'm not counting chickens but i i i i please 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 i hope 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 oh well that's very exciting so fingers crossed for you and we're all going to be paying attention to see whatever this is and i like congratulations and even even though speedy didn't take off the way that it should have um i'm glad that you got to do something with it because yes. I'm, I'm sure that that for it to mean that much to you even if it's just two episodes i guarantee you that meant something to some children somewhere that it meant a lot it. it meant a lot to my son um we we watched the episodes together with him on my lap and it brought tears to my eyes to watch it with connor in my lap and it was one of those things where uh where it was just shortly thereafter uh um he got um i'm mean, like like i mean like right after that he had gotten groot for um, Spider-Man Maximum Venom. And he wound up recording that within that very same week we watched the Speedy Gonzalez thing. And it just really felt like the whole universe just coming together right there. It was really magical and really special. That's great that you guys get to share that. You get to share these experiences. And even if you're just watching each other through the booth, it's really cool. It is. I'm a very fortunate guy. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us about Mary Kay Bergman? How did you guys meet? What was she like as a person? Mary Kay was a force of nature. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, still is. Uh, we met through just mutual friends. And uh, we were at a gathering. And it was it was one of those, you know eyes met across the room kind of thing uh it just just happened i thought she was cute and adorable and she apparently thought i was cute and adorable and uh turned out that she was a wannabe actress who had done a lot of training in voiceover i wanted to get into voiceover and i was telling her funnily enough i had just left voiceover to pursue to begin pursuing uh, independent filmmaking. And, uh, and so I was able to talk to her a lot about um, the world of voiceover. Um, and then I watched this magical career of hers skyrocket. It was, was amazing, the likes of which I have never, ever seen. Uh, and it was, it was a truly magical time. And the whole time that was going on, Again, I was pursuing filmmaking, um, but I would always do some character voice somewhere and she would get me the little figurines of that character and so on, hoping I would go back. I think she always wanted to do what I'm doing with Connor, you know, work, work together. Um, but uh, uh, sadly that that did not happen. Um, but she, she uh, just an incredibly gifted actress who, who was hugely, hugely, hugely influenced by Carol Burnett. Carol Burnett was her hero. Uh, and she wanted to be Carol. She wanted to make people laugh. Uh, she, uh, she graduated from Hollywood High and then went to UCLA uh, specifically because Carol went there. <laughs> um, 
that that's really what she was that's really what she was all about and that was where her her love of of acting and being being a voice actress and all these things really came from uh was was that that need that desire to make people laugh um that that was that was her in a nutshell um she grew up off of gower street in hollywood um uh very close to the uh paramount studios uh in fact she used to go into the forever hollywood cemetery which lie which is along the back of paramount and climb over the wall onto the paramount back lot and wander the back lot as a child um you know and and she lived something like three blocks down from adriana casalotti who was the original voice of snow white um, so there was a lot of destiny in there, a lot of destiny in there. Um, she was very pixie dusted. She loved anything, anything having to do with Disney, anything having to do with Disney. Uh, we would go to Disneyland at the drop of a hat. It was, it was one of our, our very, very favorite places uh, uh, in the world. Yeah, and and we oh the the the, the amount of time we spent there. Um, she was also uh, a big fan uh, of the Los Angeles Dodgers and went to a lot of Dodger games. Um, uh, her family was originally from Brooklyn. They they were originally Dodger fans. She just wasn't didn't really get into it until October of 1988 the Dodgers were in the World Series against the Oakland Athletics and Casey was down with a flu and I had been a Dodger fan my entire life Dodger Stadium itself is only one year older than me and I said well sweetie the World Series is on I'm going to watch it and she was sick on the couch and she watched the whole World Series with me and became a huge fan after that. And after that, we were we would go to like at least one game every homestand. Uh, so so that was another thing. Another thing about her is she loved chocolate. Like she's the only human being I knew who would get Nestle's Quick, the powder that you put in milk, and put the powder in a cup and eat it with a spoon. <laughs> and it would cause this kind of dust that would make her cough. So it'd be the cutest thing seeing her with this little, 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 little Dodger helmet that she bought ice cream in at Dodger Stadium, full of chocolate, and sitting there eating it. And you, it was hilarious. Um, she loved, she loved her chocolate. Um, she, she, uh, she loved movies. One of her favorite films was Noises Off with Carol Burnett. Um, I, I adore that film as well. Um, but she also had uh, a, a, a little bit of a dark streak as well. Um, she also loved movies like Die Hard and The Exorcist and uh, Alien and Aliens. Um, so as a genre film fan, that's one of the things we completely bonded over. Uh, and I wore this shirt because I have a wonderful picture of her uh, dressed up as the bride in, for Halloween. Uh, which is why I'm wearing this shirt right now because I need you to ask have some questions about that. Um, so, so she was a big fan of that as well. Uh, she also loved theater. Uh, we saw a lot of plays. She was a huge, huge fan of Carrie Fisher. Um, uh, there's a number of of, of plays, uh, uh, one woman shows that that she did, Delusions of Grandma, and so on. Uh, Wishful Drinking. So we we saw we saw all those shows. Um, again, she was she was an enormous fan. Um, like I said, she was very much a force of nature. The unfortunate side uh, of it all that that I have to touch, I absolutely must touch upon, is that um, she also suffered from generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, and it was undiagnosed. And like many people with generalized anxiety disorder, uh, it can come off looking like uh, you're overworked. And for someone who worked as much as she did, 
uh, which was it was an incredible. I mean, the week before she uh, she died, uh, the Hollywood Reporter did an article on the top women in animation, and she was listed among the top five. Uh, her her the work was tremendous. So it was it was it was very easy for everyone to believe that that she was just being overworked and overtired and she felt trapped like she couldn't talk to people about it uh, she she once confided to some people how she was feeling um and trying to get the words out and um I, i'll never forget this because we didn't understand what was going on um these people um bit her head off they were like i don't want to hear this i would i i would I would do anything to have your career. I don't want to hear you complaining about it. And she wasn't trying to complain. She was trying to say she was in pain. But nobody wanted to hear it. It was like, you have everything. You, 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 you've been in 30 feature films and 40 animated shows. And, you know, you were, your Beauty and the Beast was nominated for an Oscar. Your song, Blame Canada, was nominated for an Oscar. You know, you know we don't want to hear how your life is hard. And so she just, she closed in, um, you know, nobody, she couldn't get the message out that she was in serious pain. And I only know this because she started talking to relatives on the East Coast. She felt they were the only ones that she could talk to. She didn't even feel safe talking to me. This is very, this is actually very typical as I, I came to find out with generalized anxiety disorder that you become afraid that the closest people to you will think you're nuts. So you just keep it inside. And so they were like calling him and saying, you know, don't, um, um, we're gonna, so she was setting up a big vacation. We were gonna go to vacation in New Orleans and, and all this, uh, all, all these things we were gonna do. Um, and I was like, good. Cause you're, yeah, you're, you're working yourself to death, sweetie. I, I, I was very worried for her. No idea really um, how much more serious. And, and it's funny, it's one of the things that I get asked a lot is how, how could you, you know, not know you know, that, that this person you love was is suicidal. And it's like, well, one of the things that's a common story is if you're not a suicidal person, you can't imagine someone you love would even fathom the idea of taking their own life. So that idea never occurred to me. So it was like, yes, sweetie, let's take that vacation. Let's, let's go to New Orleans for two weeks. Let's, let's tell your agent, don't send you any work. Let's do, let's do all it. Never occurred to me that she was in that level. It never occurred. And, and again, this is a common thing for that situation. If you don't think that way, that's the last thing that will ever come to, come, come to mind, right? Uh, and I heard a lot of this actually from people um, a lot of name people in the industry who reached out to me afterwards who said, I'm suffering too, let me tell you what was going on in my life. This might shed some light on you, that you don't blame yourself for this. And I'm thankful for these people. So, so thankful for these people for reaching out to me because I, I didn't, what did I, what did I do wrong? What did I, you know, how could I, it's just, yeah, you don't know. So uh, on the anniversary of her passing, which is November 11th, uh, every year I put a large post up where I put crisis lines and numbers and I tell people, you know, um, my wife believed that no one could understand the pain that she was going through. No one that, 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 that there was no way out, you know, and, and she was wrong, you know, and I, and I tell people learn from that. Don't make that mistake. Let there be one less widower in the world, you know, if you are suffering from any form of mental pain, you know, bi bipolar disorders, anxiety, depression, reach out. There are people who want to help you. I didn't know that then. You know, when, when we emptied our home after she died, I found like St. John's Wort and all of these things hidden all over the place where she was clearly trying to self-medicate and keep going because she was terrified to reach out and talk to somebody. I wish she had picked up a crisis line and talked to somebody. Um, severe, severe generalized anxiety disorder has a pretty high mortality rate. So we don't know what would have happened, but I, I wish I, I wish she had, I wish she had reached out. I wish she had 
come just come right out and and you know talk to people who who would who knew and understand so i'm saying to any of you who are watching this we're listening to this if you suffer from any form of mental pain and disorder and you feel that you're alone you feel that no one understands you feel that you have no way out it's not true this world is better with you than without you. There is help out there. Find those lines. You can go to Wikipedia. You can look up crisis lines. You know, don't be another tragic story like my Mary Kay. Her voice, her work, everything she's done from South Park to Beauty and the Beast and so on, it continues to live on. But there should have been more. There should have been more. Now, from my point of view as a survivor, one of the things that I want to make clear is that uh, I have a beautiful son. I am remarried now. I married my old high school sweetheart. We ran into each other at a party. We hadn't seen each other in 26 years. And it turned out the spark was still there. And we're now together and we had Connor. Um, I don't have Connor. And this is important. I don't have Connor because my wife died. If my wife hadn't died, Connor wouldn't exist. No, I have Connor because I chose to re-embrace life. So another word to any of you out there who is a survivor, I found a group called Survivors After Suicide. That was a, a group, that was a, a group uh, session thing that was put together by the uh, Los Angeles Suicide Prevention Center. And, and that group helped basically save my life. And I, again, I, I came to re-embrace life and that's why I have my son. You know, this is why I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that in now this chapter of my life. Um, you know, Mary Kay and I, we were, we were together for 12 years. Uh, my wife, Casey, and I am my, uh, not my, Connor, Connor's 13, but Casey and I have been together now almost 20. You know, so, um, life did continue. I did believe for a while there that I was never going to live again, that I was only going to exist. Uh, but I'm living now. Uh, but I, I don't want to say that chapter is gone, the door is closed, and it was to be forgotten. It's, no, it should never be forgotten, which is why I make those posts. And I say, I, I reach out to people and I tell them, you know, find help. It's worth it. Let, let there be one less person in the world like me, one less widower, please please. Because if you believe as my wife did, that you're, all you're going to do is end your pain and suffering, it's not true. All you're going to do is hand it to everybody who loved you. I will forever live with that pain. It's going to be a part of me for the rest of my life. I love my Mary Kay dearly, but I live with that now. Don't do that. Find help. That's all I want to say on that. She sounded like a wonderful, amazing person. I'm sorry that she suffered so much and, and that she tried to talk to people and people just pushed her away. Like that's, that's terrible. Unfortunately, that is, that is the truth. I, I witnessed it happen and uh, I didn't understand what was going on. Or I might've said, you're not understanding what my wife is saying. Cause she wasn't even telling me. Right. right? Um, and I'm sure she's not the only one in that situation. I'm sure there are others. You know, I remember um, there was a there was a, a Esquire magazine. Esquire magazine contacted me and wanted to do a full spread article on Mary Kay. They they asked for photographs. They asked for you know wedding pictures, all of these things, all of the stuff. And I sat down and we did this long interview and so on. And all the questions were about you know all of these things having to do with uh, mental breakdown, uh, like, like uh, um, you know, drugs, alcohol, wild sex, parties, you know, all of the, the Hollywood story of the guy crashing before. And I said that there was none of that. There was none of that. She had, a, she had a mental disorder. There was none of these things that, 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 you know, you're looking for the E true Hollywood story of the Hollywood excess. No, that was not her story. Esquire magazine then contacted me back and said, you know what, if we do an issue on mental illness, we'll reconsider doing this. And they canceled the whole thing. That's never been ran. Yeah. That's awful. It's, yep. it, it shouldn't be about the story. It should be about her life. Yeah. 
celebrating her life, what she yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. Yep. They, 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 they really should. They really should. I, 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 I hope whoever it is at, at uh, Esquire magazine is ashamed of themselves <laughs> because they did a real yeah. disservice because there's a lot of people who would have benefited greatly from hearing the story. Right. It wasn't obviously sensational enough for them. So that's terrible. I'm also happy that you have chosen to live your life and not live in misery. <laughs> No, yeah, I have I have come to re-embrace I've come to re-embrace life. I mean, I had a lot of I had a lot of uh bad episodes. I I had a lot of issues with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um I would be lying if I said I'm I'm not still uh, you know, a little damaged from it. Um I probably always will be, but but every day is better. Every day is better. And with the 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 loving loving unconditional support of my wife um, who I actually have to pick up from a train station in about 15 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, um, I, with, without her help, I, I, I don't know if I could have gotten through it. Um, you know, she's, she's been, 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 been my rock. She has been my rock. So yeah, I, I have a very good life now. I have a very good life now. And watching, watching my son, uh, has been spectacular. I think all good parents want their children to exceed them. And my son's doing it in spades, you know. He's singing and dancing in a musical. I never did that, you know. He did Disney's Eureka. You know how many Disney shows I got to co-star in? None, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, he did a press tour for uh, We Baby Bears, and I said, "You did great, son." He said, "How'd you do for your first pre press tour?" I never done one, you know. <laughs> yeah, and and he is, you know, he is that apple in the eye. Yeah. It's great that you guys have such a good relationship and you can bond over voice acting and, and the movies that you watch with them. It, it's awesome mm -hmm. to see your relationship because I do follow you on Facebook. It's awesome oh. to see the pictures that you post and, and how close you are. And it's, it's just great. We are so close. We just did a vacation in Yosemite and we spent like half the vacation planning videos. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was great. Was there any other, you know, big questions you wanted to ask? Well, Please. I would like to ask this one because obviously we sure. love Scooby and we are the Scooby panel. Right. So, right. So, Mary Kay's Daphne in yes. Zombie Island was really yes. a Daphne for a new generation. It was. Now, over, over the My years, God, was she proud of that. Oh, My so God, glad. was she proud of that. And, yeah. and, and she received as a gift for doing it one of the animation cells from the movie of Daphne. It's framed. I have it on a wall. If I was intelligent, I would have taken it down and brought it so I could show you. <laughs> um, she was so, so proud of that. Uh, Scooby-Doo was one of her favorite things. Again, she had a little, little, little bit of, uh, of darkness to her. So, uh, so her, her, you know, her, her, Disney animated world and monsters, you know, Scooby-Doo is a perfect mix. And, and oh my God, was she proud of that. Um, she loved doing anything having to do with Scooby-Doo. She loved playing Daphne. Um, Gray, uh, Gray Delisle was Mary Kay's protege. And she, she trained Gray. And, and when Gray got the part, boy, I, I thought that's, that's the way it should work. That's the way it should be. You know, if, if, if Mary Kay could have personally groomed her for it, you know, um, it, it's just, yeah, that was, that was an amazing, amazing thing. Um, but, oh, oh, she had little, little Scooby figurines. She, she, we, again, we, oh, we've bought so many animation cells. I have a bunch of cells from, from Zombie Island uh she 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 bought the movie posters she you know, this was something she was this was this for her was right up there with snow white and doing the yodeling for jesse the yodeling cowgirl in toy story 2 you know this was the these 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 were these were landmark landmark things for her this was this was bucket list stuff for her and, and, and yeah, she was so, so very proud of that. So very proud of that. 
and that I mean, I mean, really, you she probably would have would if she were to make a list, she would talk about being in Beauty and the Beast, doing Snow White, Daphne from Scooby Doo, and then creating all these characters for South Park. You know, it's just like, yeah, but she was she was so so proud of that, and they worked ensemble. Uh, and, and everyone in the cast, um, was, was just, just, uh, marvelous to her. And when I run into them, uh, in studio, um, they're pretty marvelous to me, which is awesome. You know, which is great. I, 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 am I'm, I'm, I'm pretty tickled about that. <laughs> uh, Frank Welker has taken pictures with my son a number of times. He's always comes over and says hi all the time. Uh, Frank and Mary Kay actually worked together on um, on the movie um, uh, Deep Blue Sea. Uh, uh, unfortunately, they screwed up and Mary Kay didn't get credit. But if you look at Deep Blue Sea, there's a talking parrot. The parrot sounds are Frank Welker. The parrot speaking is Mary Kay. Oh. But for some reason, only Frank was credited in the movie. Um, yeah, uh, but it's, but they work, they work together on that, you know, so they work together on, uh, in fact, Mary Kay did so many animals and creature sounds, uh, they, she, they would call her Francis Welker. Uh, <laughs> and, and so they're, they're all just, they're all just sweethearts. And, and yeah, Frank is, Frank is always one of those guys who comes right over, gives me a hug. He's just, just, the, the, he is a sweetheart, such a sweetheart. That's great. Uh, the last question, do you have any fun stories that you can share with us about oh. anything? Your career, Mary Kay, anything you want to share that's fun? Oh, my goodness. A uh, funny story. Okay. My son came in the other day, just the other day. He walked in. And, and, and again, if I thought long and hard about, about Mary Kay, I'm sure I could come up with some funny stories, you know. Uh, it's, it's funny how everything kind of blends together and becomes just one with my heart, you know, that it's, it's, it's not as easy for me to, to, to single out certain things as, as, you know, almost 25 years or so or past. Um, but just the other day, my son walks in and I'm sitting right here in front of my computer. And he says, you want to hear a joke? And I said, sure. And he says, uh, why did the chicken cross the road? So I don't know, son, why? He says, to get to the idiot's house. <laughs> and I just stared at him. He said, wait, 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 I got another one. Knock, knock. Who's there? The chicken. I'll tell wow. you one. I'll, I'll tell you one more, and that's so. There's this is a funny story for me. Uh, I worked on uh, the video game Sengoku Basara Samurai Three, something like that. Anyway, um, Sengoku Basara. Anyway, I played Kenshin, God of War, and I got a call from Talison Jaffe, the director. He says, "Dean, I got this part. I want you to audition for it." I was like, "Okay." So I drive out to the studio. And I went and I said, okay, tell me about this character. This is Kenshin's God of War. Now, this role is usually played by a woman. This character is very androgynous, but the producers would like to do something different. And they liked what you did in Arkham Asylum. So they think you you could do it. They said, oh, they want a scarecrow kind of voice. No, no, we, they don't want a scarecrow kind of voice. They just like what you did. So <laughs> I said, okay, so what are you looking for? And they said, well, try to imagine. And the producers were all there from Tokyo. And they, they said, try to imagine. A, an alien's concept of what it means to be a drag queen. Okay. So I got in front of the mic and I said, I am Kenshin, God of War. And they were perfect. <laughs> and that's how I got that part. So there's your other, there's your other funny story. Oh, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> Well, Dino, thank you so much for your time, for talking about your career, your son's My career. My pleasure. We are so happy for both of you, and we wish you both everything you could ever imagine. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you for telling us about Mary Kay. We appreciate that a lot. Thank you and for asking, because it keeps her memory alive. 
And yeah. And that's that's something that that I very much want to do is is keep that keep that memory alive. I, I don't want her to be forgotten. Uh, and and it's a story that that shouldn't be forgotten. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. And we'll definitely look forward to seeing this mystery project. <laughs> Uh, you everyone, know, everyone. it'll be all it, it it'll be all over uh, it'll be all over social media if it happens. Uh, if not, I might say. By the way, I did work on this, but <laughs> that's how it goes. You know, we'll be on the lookout for your. We'll be on the videos. lookout, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. I actually have to go to a train station and <laughs> pick my wife Thanks. up. So uh, this right. was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to another Scooby panel. I'm Nikki Blake from ScoobyAddicts.com. If you like these panels, please subscribe to my channel for more great discussions. A huge shout out to our patrons, Julie Rosen, Ross from ScoobyFan.net, Scooby-Doo of Roblox, Ruth Elliott Hilsden, and Tage. If you would like to support the Scooby panel, please go to Patreon.com slash ScoobyAddicts. A very special thank you to voice actor Dino Andrade, an artist, blogger, and Scooby collector, Wendy Bridge. Scooby Panel is available in podcast form on most podcast platforms or as a web series on YouTube. You can find Scooby Panel on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as at Scooby Panel. Scooby and Shaggy were voiced by Scott Ennis. Check out Scott's website, onescottshop.com. Scooby Addicts artwork by Will Davenport. Video editing by Nikki Blake. Music composed and performed by Bovine Nightmares. Please join us next time for another Scooby panel.